Welcome to the Thursday broadcast of Wisdom in the Word. We're so glad that you're joining us on this thoughtful Thursday. It's a great day to be able to get into God's Word together, and we're glad that you're taking some time to study the Bible together with us. If you're watching us on Facebook or on YouTube, we want to encourage you to sign in and uh, also to share the link, share out with uh, other people who might be interested uh, in the uh, broadcast. Maybe uh, you know somebody else who would love to maybe write in a Bible question or be interested in in getting the answers to some of these Bible questions, we'd be glad to uh, help you out uh, if you want to send those in to us. And uh, be great if you just share that information out and allow us uh, to be able to minister to other people through you. Uh, Today, we're going to get into uh, some of our listener questions. We've got two that we're going to tackle today. If you've got more questions, we want to encourage you to send them over to us. Uh, We're uh, expecting to be able to add. I think uh, I've got about uh, 13 or 14 questions here um, that I'm still working through after today. Um, So I hope that you will uh, send me some questions uh, that I can add to the list and constantly studying and working towards this. Every Tuesday, again, we're in the book of Hebrews. Every Thursday, we're answering your questions. In just a moment, we're going to get started. We hope that uh, you'll we'll see you this weekend uh, in one of our church services. Um, looking forward to a time of worship on Sunday. We're continuing on on Sunday, looking at the concept of salt, uh, being the salt of the earth. We hope that you'll join us then uh, on our uh, Sunday morning services. And Sunday evening, we're back in the book of Esther this week. So we hope that you'll join us for that. In just a moment, we're going to get officially the audio podcast started. And so we appreciate you being here. Grab your Bibles. We're going to run a couple references today. Uh, Hopefully it'll be a help to you. We'll get things started here in just a moment. Welcome to the Thoughtful Thursday broadcast of Wisdom in the Word. We're so glad that you've joined us today. Looking forward to answering our listeners' questions today as uh, we do each Thursday on our broadcast. Today we're going to begin with a question about remarriage. Uh, Again, divorce and remarriage is probably one of the deepest quagmires in all the Bible, a difficult concept to be able to understand and work through a lot of nuances to it. But this one has got a little bit of a twist to it. So let me read our question. Is there anything biblically wrong with a pastor getting remarried if the Lord has called his wife home to glory? For example, a young pastor who loses his wife to cancer, a, a car accident or whatever. Would it be wrong for that pastor to get remarried and remain behind the pulpit? After all, marriage ends at the death of a spouse. All right, so here's a good question. It's about remarriage, but specifically tailored to talking about pastors being remarried, but specifically about pastors who have lost their wife through death getting remarried. Now, again, I'm glad this this current kind of clarified itself as we got a little further along because first off, there's a big issue and big question about the concept of remarriage. And uh, we don't have time to today. Maybe somebody would uh, like to suggest that we do a Bible study or ask a question on that. This is a very deep and broad subject on the matter of divorce and remarriage and what's allowed. And uh, again, we believe the Bible teaches some very specific things about that. Additionally, um, there's even further uh, talk about uh, pastoral qualifications, um, a pastor being qualified to be able to, um, to be able to, uh, be in the pulpit if he is, can a pastor be divorced? Is it, is it possible for a man who's divorced to pastor? And again, is a, is a difficult, very difficult question uh, to be able to ask when you look at the scriptures. And now this one, again, kind of takes us a step further. Uh, we understand that the pastor was married and um, we're understanding that he's lost his his wife due to some sort of sickness. In fact, our listener asks he loses his wife to cancer, a car accident, or whatever. Uh, would it be wrong for that pastor to get remarried and remain behind the pulpit? Well, let's talk about this for just a little bit. And um, you know, when we talk about qualifications, one of the first places we have to go is the book of First Timothy. And uh, this is where we find the qualifications for a pastor. Uh, there's a list here in First Timothy. There's also a list in Titus about these things. But if we look at First Timothy uh, chapter number three, it gives us some specifics about it. And, you know, as you look through this passage, you find a phrase, a bishop then must be blameless, 
the husband of one wife. Now, this particular phrase is um, is is often debated, and I don't have time to debate it today concerning the matter of divorce. But let's say this. Some people would say that if a pastor's wife died and um, he got remarried, he wouldn't, he'd be the husband of a second wife. And so he couldn't be in the pulpit because he's been married more than once. And again, I believe that stretches this scripture beyond what its natural intent. Uh, this scripture has a, a moral intent uh, to it. Uh, it's a moral qualification. The husband of one wife, it talks about that, that marriage, the quality of that marriage um, and how we are to understand that. And so, um, this particular verse cannot be used, I do not believe, to stretch outside of its intent to be able to include a second marriage for a man whose wife has died. Certainly, we understand that a person is eligible for remarriage after he or she is widowed or uh, he becomes a widower. Um, not only does the Bible uh, not speak against remarriage after a spouse dies, uh, in some cases, it actually encourages it. Uh, the Jewish culture in biblical times also encouraged this for different reasons. In most cases, the Bible addresses the issue of widows rather than widowers. However, there's nothing within the context of any of these passages leading us to believe that the standard was gender specific. That is, we believe that whatever was said about widows could also be said of widowers, that if a widow could remarry and should be encouraged to remarry, perhaps a widower also in the same vein. Now, there's a reason why the Bible primarily addresses widows and doesn't address widowers. First off, um, that would be because the men were the ones that usually worked outside the home in that culture. And, um, in biblical times, uh, men had shorter lifespans on average than their wives, and widows were far more common than widowers. Uh, sometimes men did dangerous jobs, and so they hazarded their lives in order to be able to do what they did. And uh, women were often left without a man much more often than uh, men were left without a wife or a woman. Now, the second reason why the Bible might address the widows more than widowers was that women had didn't have any means of supporting themselves. That is, if the men worked outside, the women and children did not have any real means of being able to take care of themselves if there was not a marriage in place. Remarriage was the primary way in which a widow would regain protection and provision for the needs of herself and her children. Uh, once Christ established his church, the church became responsible for the care of widows under certain circumstances. But even in those circumstances, uh, the Bible tells us that uh, the family should have charge over them first before the church is to be burdened and that uh, younger widows ought to remarry. And that the um, when we talk about the, the younger widows, that they ought to seek remarriage, again, for the, the purpose of support. And again, all of that was because they lived in a society where men often did um, the work outside the home and women did the work inside the home. So that was their their culture. That was the way that it was set up. And uh, so now the third issue for addressing widows rather than widowers was that the importance of continuing that husband's family name and that family line. Jewish culture was very concerned with that. Um, so if a husband died without leaving any children to carry on his name, his brother was encouraged to marry the widow and provide her with children. Other men in the family had the option also, but there was a proper order in which each man had the opportunity to fulfill or pass on this responsibility. We see uh, some of this with the kinsman redeemer in the book of Ruth, a uh, very interesting uh, thought process on redeeming a family line, giving a child to uh, someone. So there's a reason why the Bible addresses widows more than widowers, but that doesn't mean that these principles still apply to widowers. Um, the Bible does teach us, and Paul giving this illustration in Romans chapter number seven, he's actually talking about the law and he's talking about our relationship, a Christian's relationship with the law, but he uses marriage in this particular passage as a, an example of the relationship that's broken off with the law. And the and he, he states this concerning the matter of truth. He says, For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. That is, 
They were free to remarry. It was common understanding that you were free to remarry if uh, and when your spouse died. So that was applied both to widows and to widowers uh, in that particular day. So again, Paul teaches this in Romans 7, 2, and 3. Um, and again, when a man and woman get married, God unites them as one flesh. And the only thing that can, we even include this in the marriage bond. We would say, you know, till death do us part. And the goal is to stay together until well, one person is dead. And if one person is dead, it frees them up. If they're young enough, if they have the desire to uh, be remarried, then they certainly can. The only thing that they can break the marriage bond in God's eyes is death. So if a, a person's spouse dies, the widow or the widower is absolutely free to remarry. And there's no reason to believe that there's any uh, prohibition against pastors um, people who are elders or bishops who are ruling in the church uh, that would prevent them from remarrying if their spouse died as well. There's no biblical uh, passage that would teach that. And the, the um, word of God teaches this in multiple passages of scripture uh, very clearly. So I think um, as we look at that question, there's nothing prohibiting um, a pastor from, from doing that. And again, I would I encourage I, I when it, when I hire even for our staff, um, I want to have someone who's married only because of the uh, of the all of the things that exist in our world uh, that that require is it's, it's more and more difficult in our sexualized Western culture uh, to, to do what we do without having a wife. It's just, it's just helpful. It's more beneficial, uh, to being able to do it. Uh, but certainly there are some, some other things to consider in regards to a pastor being divorced or, um, even to uh, a pastor being remarried, uh, in other situations. But if the spouse dies, I certainly see no biblical prohibition against it. Uh, let's move on to our second question today. This one goes, uh, deals with the book of Revelation, deals with the book of Revelation. And we're going to look at a couple of uh, things here uh, in this particular chapter. First off, as we think about the coming of the Lord in the book of Revelation, who are the 144,000 mentioned in chapter 14 of the book of Revelation? And then a second follow-up question is, what city is Babylon today? in today's world? What city is Babylon uh, in today's world? Well, all right. This is um, definitely an interesting question. We're uh, delving in and we're almost picking up in the middle of the story here. Um, who are the uh, 144,000 mentioned in chapter 14 of Revelation? Well, let's go back because the 144,000 don't begin to be mentioned in Revelation. Their identity is given to us in Revelation chapter number seven. In fact, that's where they're actually spoken of the first time, Revelation chapter number seven. And uh, we find them here first. We'll look at this scripture in just a moment. Let me first off say there's a couple of different uh, interpretations of this. Um a couple of different thoughts about the 144,000. Um, first off, we have probably um, the one of the, the most difficult thoughts, and that is the 144,000 spoken of in relationship to the Jehovah's Witness. Um, the Jehovah's Witness believe that the 144,000 are a select group of people that are saved, and that's pretty much all. Now, they have more than 144,000, which is problematic for them. So there are 144,000 to get to go to the highest level of heaven. Um, but then there are other people that get included because they had to readjust their doctrine when they had more than 144,000 of them, uh, which really wasn't very, um, wasn't very um, uh, hopeful of them as far as when they began their religion, that they didn't expect more than 144,000 uh, converts. But again, they have more than 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses, and so they had to modify. Let me say to you, I do not believe that in the Jehovah's Witness doctrine of the fact that there's only 144,000 people in heaven or, or that that's all that get to go to heaven. I think that's a false doctrine as well as many other things that the Jehovah's Witness teach. 
But on top of that, there are a couple of interpretations that are given uh, to this passage. And um, uh, again, I've, I've looked at both and uh, I'm going to tell you where I fall today. But let me give both of those to you. The first one is a is what we would call the spiritual interpretation. Uh, some would take the 144,000 of all the tribes of Israel to spe- be a spiritual reference to Christians. Uh, they would say... Um, They would say that the the tribes here in this passage is, this is a perfect revelation. Um, It's 12 times 12 uh, times a thousand. It's it's a picture of completeness. Um, When you look at Revelation chapter uh, number seven, the picture here is is of uh, the the tribes are are oddly numbered here in this text. It's not really referring to Israel itself. It's referring to a group of people that are uh, a representative group of people that are saved. It's symbolic of a of a larger uh, number of people, a larger group of people. And it really is telling us about the completion, just like when we talk about the 24 elders, the 24 elders were were complete. Um, and we believe they're gathered around the throne. These 144,000 um, are representative of, of the church, the representative of the people that are redeemed in the book of Revelation. Uh, they're from all nations and they're redeemed. And, and that's the, the concept. And um, if you look at Revelation chapter seven and verse number nine, the Bible says in this, I beheld and lo a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And some people believe after this description in verses one to eight of Romans of uh, Revelation chapter number seven, that verse number nine actually opens up and tells us that um, this is the people that's being described. It's not really Jews, it's people of every tribe. This is the same group in verse number nine that's being described, but it's not uh, just Jews, it's people of every tribe, of every nation. So they would take the designations of the first eight verses and they would say that this is, um, is typical. We would take a spiritual interpretation to this and they would say that this is representing more than just. You'll see in verse number uh, 10, they're crying with a loud voice, salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne. So that's that's one interpretation, one possibility. The other interpretation, the other possibility that uh, people who read the book of Revelation and try and interpret it in a future sense would say, uh, they would take this passage literally and they would say, well, the, this is a reference to the 144,000 Jews um, who will be saved during the tribulation period, that there will be 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. Um, and they'll say, well, Dan is not listed. And they'll say, what, well, uh, Levi is listed among the 12 tribes. Uh, Dan was not listed because he went into idolatry. And so that's the reason why he's not, uh, not listed. Um, and so when you look at this text, um, it, this is teaching us, um, that, Again, there'll be 12,000 Jews from each of the 12 tribes, and this is literal. And so uh, they would give us the literal uh, understanding of this, that um, these men will be evangelists. They'll be working and laboring uh, in the tribulation period in order to be able to bring people to Christ. Um, they will be protected. They have the seal of God in their foreheads. Uh, Revelation 7 and verse number 3 and 4, uh, they're protected specially by God. Uh, so they would take more of a, a literal approach to this. So those are the two main main interpretations. And again, there's a lot more to be able to explain, uh, you know, with the lion and the lamb and the way that they look at them. But there's a spiritual interpretation um, of it. And then there's the literal interpretation of uh, Revelation chapter number seven and who these people are. Um, and I say, well, which side do you land on? Well, again, I, I believe in taking the Bible literally when there's no when when we when we look at the Bible, unless there's a reason given in the text to not take it literally, that is, I believe we ought to take as, as try and take as much of a literal approach and literal interpretation as we possibly can. Let me say this: there is no indication anywhere in this passage, in my estimation, 
that would say tribe is anything other than a tribe. A tribe is always used uh, of a literal ethnic group in scripture. I don't see any reason why these can't be Jews. I don't find the fact that they know which tribe they're from problematic. Um, it, again, it doesn't say that they know which tribe they're from. It says that God knows and then he seals them. There's no reason to believe here in this text that God can't uh, choose 12,000 from each tribe. God certainly still knows uh, the tribes that are listed. Um, I would say that on further support of a literal interpretation, Jesus spoke of the 12 apostles um, whom we know were literal persons sitting on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel in the last day, Matthew 19 and verse number 28. So there's no reason to not to take this as reference to 12 literal tribes of the Israelites. Um, and again, uh, so I'll, I'll say to you, I believe that in the literal interpretation of this passage and, and throughout the book of Revelation, um, that this ref refers to 12,000 Jews from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And that as they're given to us here in Revelation chapter number seven, uh, all of these, all of these Jews will be those evangelists. They'll be sealed and protected. Uh, they're, they're sharing Christ during this time. Um, and they are literal Jews. They are not a picture of anyone, anyone or anything else. Um, now, let me move on to the second part of this question, and that was what city What city is Babylon? Um, what city is Babylon today in today's world? Well, uh, let me say that the Bible does not tell us what city Babylon is. Uh, we do not know. Um, we probably shouldn't speculate other than using the Bible uh, pictures that we have. Some would say that it's Rome. Um, and that's, that's a possibility. Rome was called the city, city of the seven hills. Um, we believe that there's a, an association with Rome um, and Babylon, but to say definitively that it is um, would be really just conjecture on our part, trying to uh, fit pieces together. Um, and so I would say to you that it, it probably doesn't exist. Some people believe that it's a, a city that will be built uh, in the future. That's also very plausible that it will be a city that is yet to be built. It is a city that is coming that will be a great city. Um, and so that's a possibility as well. Um, you say, well, you know, well, what, what do you think? I, I hate speculating on some of these types of things because what it does is it drives the engine for people who are fueled by prophetic visions and testimonies. I believe we're called to serve the Lord, to look for a, a living savior who is coming again for us, but to use that as a blessed hope and motivation to be able to serve him in this present day. Uh, some of this speculation doesn't help us. It doesn't advance the cause of Christ. It puts us in, in a position where we do damage to the text and damage to our position because we speculate late and we end up uh, becoming wrong uh, as time changes, if we're not careful on this. Uh, so I believe Babylon is a real future city. I don't know that the Bible tells us where it's located. Now, there are some things I can tell you about Babylon. I could answer that question by just simply saying, we don't know, and then just leave it there for you. But I, I feel like incumbent upon me to add a little bit more information about Babylon. You know, it's evident from the study of the book of Revelation that reference to Babylon goes beyond that of a single isolated city. Now, I do believe there will be a city, and I believe the city will be a reality, and it may be a future reality. It may be a city that's today that's rebuilt. It may be one of the cities that we know, but it will be definitely a city, a future city. But there's information here in the text as we look at Revelation that says that it's probably more than just a city. Uh, first off, and you read Revelation 17 and 18, you come to three conclusions. You come to, first off, Babylon is a system, okay? And you understand that it's not just a city, it's a system. It's more than just a single isolated city. It's a system that opposes God. In fact, that's what it's always been. Babylon, from the very beginning, you go back to Babylon in the very beginning, it was a the Tower of Babel. The, the, it was a, a system, a city that opposed and rebelled against God. That's what it's going to be in the end. It's what it was in the beginning. It's what it's going to be in the end. 
Now, uh, Babylon is a system. First of all, it's a religious system. If you read Revelation 17, verses 1 to 7, you find that Babylon is a religious system. There is worship involved. Um, there are uh, there, There's people who are, are, are worshiping the Lord uh, or worshiping, not, not the Lord, but worshiping the false prophet, worshiping the beast in Revelation 17. So it's definitely a religious system where people are, uh, idolatry is taking place. But not only is it a religious system, it's a political system. If you read verses 10 to 14 of Revelation chapter 17, you find that it's a political system, that there's politics involved, there's people sitting on thrones, there's people ruling over regions uh, as a result of being associated with Babylon. If you read chapter 18, verses 1 to 10, you come out with the understanding this is a political system. There's politics involved. There's nations and kings and kingdoms. You can't miss that. Then if you look at verses 11 to 19 of Revelation 18, you come to the conclusion that it's an economic system because it talks about all the things that are sold, merchandise in verse number 12 and all the different types of merchandise, selling and buying and taking place. So there is, as a, as a nation or as a city, this city has its own political system, religious system, and economic system, and it's one that is, again, opposed to God in every, every regard. So it's much more than a city. I think you'd say that it's a system. Uh, in a general sense, Revelation chapter number 17 deals with religious Babylon, while chapter 18 deals with political and economic Babylon. So if you kind of divided it up that way, it would be a little bit easier to understand. Now, an, this observation is based on some differences that's seen in comparing. If you compare the Babylon of chapter 17 with the Babylon of 18, you see some differences. First off, in Revelation 17 and 5, we have mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon. But in Revelation 18 and verse number two, we were called Babylon the Great. Babylon the Great. Uh, in Revelation 17 and verse number four, we find out that Babylon herself is rich. Okay. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup that's speaking of her wealth. So sh she's rich. But in verse three of chapter 18, she makes others rich. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. So again, in chapter 17, she's rich herself. In chapter 18, verse 3, she makes others rich. In chapter 17, in verse number 16, we find out that she's destroyed by man. 17, 16, the 10 horns, which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall eat, hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. But then in verses five to 21 of Revelation 18, which we don't have time to read, we find out that God destroys, uh, God destroys the Babylon of Revelation chapter number 18, the political and economic system. Then if you looked at verse number 16 of Revelation 17, you find that religious Babylon there is turns on the kings. In verse 16, the ten horns which saw us upon the beast says, These shall make uh, hate the whore and shall make her desolate naked, naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. That is, when you read through this text, you find that it turns on the kings. But in verse number 9 of chapter 18, this other Babylon is lamented by the kings. Verse 9, And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. So when you compare these two Babylons, they seem to be different. But again, part of the same. Um, it would be, again, like thinking of America and America's economic system and America, if America had a religious system, the politics, the economics, the religious, all of them operating separately. So again, religious uh, religious Babylon presented in Revelation 17, and then economic and political Babylon uh, given to us in Revelation chapter number 18. Now, there's so much here to talk about. Uh, this question, while seemingly surface, uh, easy on its surface, is not easy to understand because we just don't know exactly what city this is. Although we can speculate based on the information that's given to us, but 
while there will be a literal city, I think it's also very clear that we need to look at this as a system, religious, political, and economic system. So that's what we deal with when we deal with Babylon. Now, We've got some other questions coming on the horizon. Um, what does a person do with proper tithing when facing retirement? All right, so we talk about that. Uh, we're gonna, we've got another one about abstinence in the Old Testament and um, and abstinence to draw closer to God. We've got one about uh, about the end times again, uh, Luke 21, 20, 29, when Jesus says to stand firm, who's he talking about? Um, I've got, I've just got a whole bunch of things here that I think will be helpful to you. We're going to continue to work through them on our next Tuesday broadcast here in wisdom and the word. We're going to actually get into probably the most difficult passage in all of the Bible, Hebrews chapter six, verses four to six. We hope you'll join us then for our Bible study in Hebrews. We also hope you'll join us next Thursday for our answers to more questions on the thoughtful Thursday edition of wisdom in the word. Thank you once again for joining us today. We hope that your rest of your day is blessed. God bless you.